Now, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres was in the country last week. He was attending the UN Civil Society Conference, which was taking place for the first time on the African continent, hosted in Nairobi. This brought together UN agencies, the civil society organizations from across the globe to discuss the future of this planet. At that conference, President William Ruto attended it and he announced that actually Kenya has finally um, gazetted the operationalization of a piece of legislation that was signed by his predecessor in 2014, 2013 actually. It had not come into effect until it was gazetted by Interior CS Kithure Kindiki last week. This is the Public Benefit Organizations Act. What is this legislation about? Why did it take so long to operationalize it, even after it was passed by Parliament, even after it, it was assented to by the President? That's a conversation we want to have. I'm joined by two guests in the studio. From the Kenya Human Rights Commission is Martin Mavenjina. He's a senior advisor for transitional justice. And John Omwegi is the executive director, Civic Freedoms Forum. Thank you very much for joining us, gentlemen. Thank you. Very good. It's been a long journey on this particular one, Public Benefit Organizations Act, passed so many years ago. There's been a back and forth on whether it's going to be operationalized or not. In the meantime, there have been proposed amendments to the same, same piece of legislation even before it uh, got to life. But let's start with the basics. What is the PBO, Martin? Uh, thanks, Eric, uh, for having me here tonight. Uh, the Public Benefits Organization Act is um, a new piece of legislation that actually was uh, operationalized today. And I must state that today is actually a fundamental moment for very many civil society organizations because it is a journey that has taken us uh, close to 11 years. And um, we must remember that if you look around at um, the way legislation is made, this I think is the second time in Kenya's history that we've actually had an act, uh, you know, take this inordinate period of time to be operationalized. I must point out before I actually tell you that there were actually even two court orders that compelled government to actually operationalize this act in 2016 and 2017. But fast forward, we are here today. So this new, uh, the Public Benefits Organization Act is a new act that creates an enabling environment for civil society organizations. I, I mean, civil society, uh, public benefit organizations, formerly civil society organizations, you know, mm. to operate. It makes registration seamless. It creates um, a, a, a better transparency between the government and, civil, uh, and public benefit organizations. And, you know, it deals, it does away with all, you know, the rigors and the difficulties that were associated with actually forming a civil society organization then, now a public benefit organization. So mm. the long and short of it, Eric, is that it's a, it's a fundamental piece of legislation that creates an enabling environment, and we all look forward to a seamless you know, process yeah. as the act envisages. It's going to be a tough couple of months as we try and you know, balance between calling us them civil society organizations and public benefit organizations. And what's the difference, John? Why public benefit organizations? Yes, <clears throat> so thank you. Thank you, Eric, uh, for having us here. Um, um, <clears throat> For this kind of discussion, it's very important um, to, I mean, because it's going to also help unpack quite a number of things uh, for the sector members. Um, <clears throat> we have had uh, this discussion around, uh, we have organizations uh, that, I mean, amongst them, uh, Kenya Human Rights being, I mean, called NGOs, yeah. of course, registered, registered under now the uh, repealed law. And of course, we also have other, um, other, other, other very many organizations registered under different regimes. Now, um, Public Benefits Organizations Act uh, now um, gives these institutions a new name. Now, the, the, the NGOs that were registered under this law and any other institution that would like to also uh, get the benefits under this law to, I mean, gives them a name, um, public benefits organizations. And um, the justification uh, to this name is that um, um, these are organizations that are not just benefiting their own members, um, the founders and uh, maybe uh, members that have been acquired along the way, but are benefiting, uh, working to benefit members of the community. Mm -hmm. um, that's the word, that's why we, I mean, the word public uh, was used, public benefits organizations, that for organizations that work towards the benefit of the people, benefits of the public, then now you acquire this name. 
other uh, jurisdictions and other countries have also um, um, done this and um, Kenya was just hoping to align themselves with um, the global developments yeah. and so um, <clears throat> This was going to actually give us uh, one uniform um, name uh, that, I mean, it also was so meant it to change. encompasses everything. It encompasses everything and also... Just I mean, hold on, yeah. then. For a long time, when yeah. you talk about civil society organizations, yeah. uh, many have looked at those that are engaged in governance issues mm -hmm. and human rights advocacy. And then you come to CBOs, community-based organizations, also that are just involved, you know, with uh, benefiting local a issues. Then you have faith-based organizations that are involved in very many charitable works. Yeah. You have other organizations like the Red Cross, International Com Committee of the Red Cross, the Kenya Red Cross Society, that are doing public benefit work uh, and categorized. When you talk about NGOs, you don't think about them. You have foundations that are established and then they also do charitable work. Are we saying that all these things are public benefit organizations? Number one, or no. are there some that are not in this category? No. Uh, currently, what happens is that um, today being the appoint, uh, appointed day, uh, all NGOs um, <clears throat> now have the name uh, public benefits organizations. Uh, other organizations that are registered under different regimes, including the community-based organizations, including um, uh, the faith-based institutions that uh, also want to accrue benefits under this law, can also apply and be registered under this law, I mean, and be registered to uh, also have that name, public benefits organization. Now, um, of course, we have different organizations doing different um, Public benef benefit, benefit things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, Red Cross uh, works on relief and human humanitarian uh, space. We have World Vision and the likes working on um, other development issues like education. But remember that um, some of the institutions that work on governance and accountability are in, in, in most uh, in, in, in in most areas and in most communities are not perceived as. Uh, those institutions that work towards public benefit because um, in most cases they are seen in demos, mm. in most cases they are seen writing petitions, and even the, I mean, most institutions, when you say you are from the civil society organization, uh, you, I mean, there is the assumption that you are amongst the, the field, the, de, uh, the demo, the, the, the protest kind the of institution. Rouse. Yeah, but all this get to public, I mean, to benefit the members of the public. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, with the coming into effect yeah. of this particular law, Martin, yes, what changes immediately? I think the first thing that changes is that, um, well, most um, most organisations that were registered under the non uh, non government organisation and coordination act now will be referred to as public benefit organisations, and that is primarily because, with the commencement or the operationalisation of the act today the act envisaged that if you are registered under the NGO board regime, then you naturally transition to this new act. So that is the first significant change. The second is, is that this, uh, the PBO Act, as is right now, introduces um, a number of uh, new organizations. I, I say, let me call them creatures. Okay. Yes, the first is uh, uh, it will have a board that is composed of, of course, um, the CS would, 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 uh, would nominate a chairperson and that board would be composed of certain persons. Then there is a federation that would be composed of different CSOs. And then um, it also introduces a tribunal that brings about a framework of how disputes among public organization acts can be resolved. So for instance, if you applied under the new law to be registered and you didn't get a response within um, 60 days, then you are allowed to actually write to the to the board the tribunal. yes to the tribunal and then after that they would respond to you within 14 days which seem is more or less seamless uh, other than that the number of benefits that come about with this act it, it enhances more transparency for it provides for ease of you know filing returns and it's actually easy for every kenyan to actually know you know, what are the registered act assets of a specific public benefits organization, and when you actually make, uh, you can actually go into the register and know who actually searched for the specific, uh, uh, the, the specific register of a specific um, uh, public benefits organization. So it enhances transparency 
accountability and also enhances cooperation amongst public benefit organizations and the government, which was not the case before because for a long time there's been mistrust between PBOs and, I mean, between civil society organizations, now PBOs, yeah. and the government. And, the, and, and we all fondly remember that in 20, um, a couple of years, about 2016, 2017, when, uh, you know, uh, one Fazulu Mohammed by a stroke of pen, you know, uh, you know, it actually threatened to deregister de several organizations, including the Kenya Human Rights Commission, mm. on Twitter, not even through any written communication. So this act comes into, you know, to cure such mischiefs, whereby there must be a written form of communication from, you know, the relevant authority as to why. It actually lays even down grounds as to why uh, a public benefit organization act, uh, a public benefit organization would actually be deregistered or not. Okay. Yes. So it comes around with you know with several changes that are quite progressive and aligned to other democracies around the world. Let me just throw this one out there. Why yes. are PBOs important? Uh, PBOs are uh, extremely important. Not just important. Extremely important because. Um, when you look at the broad work that is done by, uh, by mes many public benefit organizations today in Kenya, one, they help in advancing. Um, first, let me start with our chapter four rights. So when you look at all, uh, uh, all, 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 all the rights that are enshrined under, uh, under the Bill of Rights, most PBOs actually advance to actually try to ensure that these laws are actually advanced and that where the government has an obligation, then it meets its obligation. A good example is we recently just uh, we, 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 we've just gone away from a flood pandemic, and you all have seen the government's you know luxury response. Secondly, PBOs play an instrumental role in terms of civic education, uh, specifically around our elections, and not elections per se, but a number of other broad uh, key governance and human rights issues. Mm. Then thirdly, uh, PBOs over time have actually helped to you know represent those who cannot, who, 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 uh, you know, those you could consider, consider maybe minorities who cannot actually maybe present petitions before courts of law. And we have seen over the last couple of years that public benefit organizations have now, uh, have actually come up with a lot of fundamental decisions that have been very progressive in courts of law. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I mean, back. I'm just jumping. Um, <clears throat> three core cool, uh, roles that are played by um, uh, PBOs. Mm. One is, um, in addition to what Martina said, um, accountability and providing checks and balances uh, to the government in addition to the various arms of government that do the same. Um, the, the, the PBOs uh, help to hold government to account um, through various ways, including court petitions, parliamentary petitions, and including picketing and other, uh, other ways and strategies. That's one. Two, they complement the, I mean, the work of government. You've just seen the recent floods, for instance. Quite a number of uh, PBOs actually stepped in to just uh, bridge the gap uh, in terms of where the government couldn't, including, uh, uh, I mean, uh, we have um, county governments struggling with issues around public participation, mm -hmm. and we've had, uh, you've seen quite a number of public benefit organizations step in to provide technical expertise, um, even when developing county integrated development plans. Um, <clears throat> Third, we also have, uh, of course, again, this is partly what Martin has also said, um, being the voices of um, the silent majority. Yeah, sometimes even including in the discussions around uh, the finance bill currently and quite a number of issues, including the NADCO report, there are those majority of Kenyans that have no technical uh, know-how to interact with such kind of, uh, of debates. And, and of course, so we have support from the PBOs to actually even make them uh, to be just the, their voices mm. uh, in the front line, yeah. It has been argued before yeah. that actually PBOs are not the voice of the citizen, they are the voice of their benefactor. Mm -hmm. And the benefactor is not a local benefactor. Mm -hmm. Many times, many of the CBOs and CSOs mm -hmm. are funded by external uh, funders. So they are a voice of those external funders. And, mm -hmm. You know, you come out there and you say you're representing the people mm -hmm. in a public participation forum or in <laughs> agitation in court or whatever, but really, yeah. there is no link between mm -hmm. an actual conversation between the said PBO and the citizens that then leads to them coming out to say we are speaking on behalf of Wanjiko. Yeah, we've had different okay. narratives. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> number one, of course, um, PBOs have been called foreign agents. 
PBOs have been called uh, evil society. Yeah. PBOs have been called um, uh, <clears throat> factories of individuals who would want to benefit themselves. Uh, <clears throat> and these are just negative narratives that um, are of course engineered uh, sometimes and in most cases by the state to just ensure that there is no goodwill from the people. Uh, but then if you look at um, even when this bill was going through parliament, yeah. um, even when the amendments uh, in 2014, uh, when 2014-2015, uh, the amendments that were tabled in, um, in, I mean, in parliament, parliamentarians came out very strongly. Um, um, I mean, one of the current CS, uh, I, I believe, is in defense currently, actually was one of those that was very loud in parliament and said, from where it comes from, most of the services are actually given by PBOs. And uh, of course, I won't dwell, I mean, delve much. I know we have, I mean, in every space you must have rotten apples. Yeah, we have those that, I uh, mean, come out to just benefit themselves. Mm. But of course, that is partly why this law was passed. And um, if you look at this law now, it's trying to build the sustainability of um, PBOs. Number one, it's uh, promoting um, income generating uh, or economic activities. Uh, as, as part of promoting sustainability so that you don't over rely on external and foreign donations so you can engage in business so uh, I mean as much I mean so so far as um, that the profit go yeah, back will into. go back into benefiting the public mm -hmm. so that's one two is that now PBOs will also have an opportunity to get preferential treatment in government procurement uh, and, and of course tender tendering processes as a means of sustaining them so that we also remove the banner of foreign agencies. Finally, we also have, um, in, in some cases where you collaborate with government, uh, under this current, uh, current law, government now um, may directly fund uh, the PBOs to actually uh, uh, provide the services to the people. And so that negative narrative that is attached to foreign funding is actually to be cured by this piece of legislation. That's why we are saying this is actually very good for the sector. Very many organizations closed from uh, between 2013 and uh, 2024. First, when we had um, a devolution, most donors with actually with the due funding, starting to support county governments, yeah. some closed shop. In 20, between 2013 and 2015, when Kenya was declared middle income country, the, the, the development partners that were supporting Kenya um, actually withdrew and started supporting now uh, Somalia. I mean, most of the funding actually were divided to low-income countries. Mm -hmm. uh, when we now got, uh, got into 2019, 2020, and with now the, I mean, corona, the pandemic, yeah. again, every country, including those that support Kenyan local PBOs, were actually supported and most funding were actually cut. Now, the war in Ukraine is actually uh, um, war in Ukraine currently, and of course the the global economic meltdown, as as as, as we are aware, um, most NGOs and most PBOs currently now have received written communication that because of the war in Ukraine, because of the economic difficulties in the West, um, 50 percent, 60 percent budget cuts. And so, and, and that's partly why we were actually pushing for this piece of legislation to just ensure that sustainability of local PBOs is actually is entrenched. Yes. 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 Mm. Yeah, so Eric, if I may just pick up from where John has left. Mm. Um, first and foremost, that is a very wrong assumption that, mm. you know, uh, I mean that, uh, you, know, you know, we benefit from donors or this or that, because the point uh, we we'll have to make first and foremost is PBOs, just like government, is funded by donors. And the reason why this act is very important because it creates, you know, it enhances transparency. Remember, all our returns are going to be filed and they will be accessible to any, you know, any, any Kenyan would want to access this record. So the assertion that, you know, we are working for and on behalf of foreign Asian agents, you know, falls flat on its foot. Secondly, when you look at most of um, the public interest litigation cases that PBOs have instituted, 99.9% .9 of these cases have been for and on behalf of either marginalized communities or the citizens of Kenya. When you look at uh, the fundamental decision, uh, I mean the, the, the landmark decision that we got in 20, uh, 2017 that annulled an election, that was partly supported by PBOs. 
uh, when you look at um, uh, some of the cases that we've taken to regional courts on phone on behalf of um, uh, the Andorois community and the OGEX, that was one on behalf of people who are marginalized. So the, 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 the assertion that we work for and on behalf of foreign agencies just does not hold water. Uh, but more importantly, when you look at, um, you know, even, even before the coming into, uh, into, in, in, into uh, even before today or even before last Friday, when the president said that the PBO Act will be, you know, commenced by the CS today or operationalized today, you realize in as much as we were moving away from the NGO Board Act, there were stri stringent provisions that still required us to comply. So, I mean, if, P if PBOs were, you know, working for foreign agents, then maybe PBOs would actually be running the country, right? You would have actually PBOs constituting government, this and that, but that is not the case. What we actually do is for and on behalf of, you know, many marginalized communities, we speak for, the voice, uh, for those who are voiceless in society, and we continue to keep government in check. Basically, okay. ours is to hold the government to, to account. Okay. Yes. But I'm sure you cannot argue yes. against the point that made many times mm -hmm. that when an external donor yes. is coming and putting money into an NGO for a certain project, mm -hmm. whether it's on governance, whether it's on accountability, whether it's on development of a local community, mm -hmm. it has a set agenda. So they come up with a fund and they say, we want to support, you know, uh, this kind of programs mm -hmm. in, in Africa and in Kenya, we're going in this route and we are asking for people to actually send their proposals mm -hmm. on how they can implement this particular agenda. Mm -hmm. So you're then funded to implement somebody else's agenda. Yes. Now, there's no question whether that funder went to the community to ask whether that is a priority area. So I think uh, what, uh, what many people don't appreciate, um, Eric, is that before actually donors send out a call for a proposal, they always do like, you know, you study the local context, right? So you don't just wake up as a donor and say, hey, I'm dropping money here. I want you guys to call and do ABC. So when you look at, um, you know, grant making and, you know, how these guys go about it, it's... It's a meticulous process that actually takes time. Mm. The, the, the only distinction is that uh, when you look at PBOs, so they are, uh, the, you know, they, they are asked the PBOs and then they're the grant makers who actually go through a meticulous process in which, uh, you know, these calls are made. And before these, uh, the, these calls actually said that many donors actually try to study the local context and there's actually consultations in certain instances with members of the communities or even with PBO, uh, PBOs before you actually, you know, respond to these calls. You don't just, so because if you use that assumption that you're saying, then it would more, more or less block, you know, respond to this, respond to that. And in that way, you could, not, you could actually respond to a call that may actually be difficult to, uh, to, to implement in the current context. So when you look at, even if you were to do a cursory look of, you know, the calls or the calls or proposals that have been done over the last couple of years, the majority of these calls respond to local context. And that, in hindsight, just shows you that there is some background work done to understand the local context. Okay. Yeah. yeah, but also, Eric, yeah? I think uh, usually that narrative is a narrative that um, takes our attention away from actually the, the, the real work and the contribution of the PBOs. Uh, because, um, yeah, someone would, work, uh, would actually ask, yeah? the same government is funded by the same agencies that put resources yeah. in um, PBOs. Actually, by the same agencies, the same diplomatic missions, the same Western uh, institutions. So, I think the main focus of discussion should be: um, Do the the public or the community members benefit from this uh, from the services of PBOs? And of course, the answer is out there. Uh, I mean, yeah, what's the answer? I mean, the answer is yes. I mean, um, um, KHRC, for instance, right. uh, I mean, just as an example. Um, has gone to court, for instance, to, uh, to petition government to compensate uh, community members that have suffered uh, human rights violations, as, a, as, as an example. We have several uh, PBOs that um, have put in so much resources. Uh, we are talking about the world visions. I mean, look, I mean, look at an institution like IMLU, for instance, um, ensuring that victims of police brutality um, get justice. I mean, the, quest, the biggest question is, 
do the members of the public receive benefits from the resources that come from the foreign agencies? And then secondly, we must also ask ourselves, why do we have to rely on local, I mean, on, on foreign, foreign donations? And the question, and the answer is in the, is in the PBO Act. Okay. Yeah. Does the PBO Act then regulate how a funding comes into the country or even is generated within country for PBOs and how PBOs determine the utilization of the funds for the benefit of the public? When it's for the benefit of the public, the assumption here would be that the public is the one that is driving this conversation. Yes. Okay. Does the PBO Act regulate this? So, um, <clears throat> number one, the PBO Act has quite a number of provisions that, um, number one, because this conversation begins, um, uh, they say charity begins at home. And so this, uh, the, uh, the, the PBO Act uh, comes with what is called self-regulation. So number one is that um, all PBOs will now be expected to self-regulate to ensure that they practice good governance, to ensure that um, they, uh, they, uh, the financial management is done properly, uh, to ensure that accountability is one of those principles that they practice. Um, there is usually an annual accounting to just ensure that the money you get is actually utilized to the purpose uh, to which it was actually intended. Now, the PBO Act ensures that, <clears throat> of course, um, of, uh, that the authority that will now come into place, the regulatory authority, together with the PBO Federation and the regional uh, self-regulation uh, institutions are put in, I mean, uh, I've, I've put up, uh, put out uh, checks and balances to just ensure that those uh, institutions that do not align with the self-regulation requirements, then are penalized. Yeah, so uh, that is one way of ensuring that um, the money that comes in, the funds that come in are used in the intended way, professionally, using the basic uh, international um, good governance uh, uh, and, and financial management standards, yeah. And Eric, if I may, yeah. just to add on, uh, on, 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 on what John has submitted, you see, in 206, um, the Grand Coalition government then came up with session of paper number six of 2006, or number one of 2006, and that was a whole consultative process whereby it sought to like identify the existing gaps in the current, uh, in, in, in the then um, NGO Coordination Board Act. When you look at that journey, that was a journey that was walked uh, uh, together with both CSOs and, you know, with the government. And the essence was, you know, to try to cure some of these, you know, gaps or some of, uh, some of these challenges. So fast forward, we came up with this, uh, this Progressive Act was, uh, was, 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 was signed by then President Kibaki. And that is why I reiterated that today marks a very fundamental, uh, fundamental moment because this act basically enhances transparency. So there is no room for you to do things, you know, or, I mean, not to be transparent. In other words, the key thing, the, the key thing for this act is the fact that actually a member of the public can actually access records of any PBO. I mean, any PBO. So in the event that there is an allegation that the funds you received we're all required to file returns annually. So there are no two ways around this. And most PBOs are actually audited. So I don't, we don't envisage a situation whereby you would not be able to self-regulate because the PBO Act sets very high standards for all of us. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that, that, is why, mm -hmm. that is why, that is what most of, uh, of, of the public benefit organizations in Kenya aspire to be. Let me just add something that is also very critical in, um, yeah. into that question. Maybe that also <clears throat> adds some weight to it. Um, this, this law, the PBO Act, also introduces a joint committee. This is a joint committee of 15 members drawn from government and um, civil society equally to do what we call an annual monitoring report uh, for adherence to the principles that are within this law. Uh, some of the principles, for instance, other than just collaboration and enabling environment, some of those principles are, I mean, transparency, integrity, so we'll have institutions, uh, members of that joint committee, every year presenting reports about compliance with these principles. And of course, part of the reason is that we ensure 
that transparency, accountability, local-led, community-led kind of um, development is actually part of the conversation that, uh, I mean, that part, part of the processes and approaches that we adopt as mm. we implement the law. Does it provide for a framework for coordination yeah. between public benefit organizations working in a certain sector, in a certain region of the country, and the government as well? We've had this uh, many times where you find several NGOs are working in the same community, doing the same thing, uh, duplicity of, of roles and functions and effort. And then the county government or the national government is also trying to do the same, same thing, thing in another corner. And if you look at the amount of money spent doing that thing, it's so much for little output. Again, uh, Whereas coordination yeah. would have mm -hmm. ensured better results. Yeah, yeah again, um, <clears throat> one of the principles that is... Um, uh, very explicit in this legislation is cooperation between government and PBOs. And um, within that principle is to ensure that uh, there is improved coordination, that um, <clears throat> there is mutual, um, mutual desire for, for collaboration in every area that um, the PBOs and government would be working, that we have same interests there. So, and again, that joint committee will also be bringing out challenges in um, implementation of collaboration between government and CSO. So some of these issues will be coming out annually. And again, being a, a new legislation, we have a transitional period where we'll be trying to test some of these things. Um, when it comes to May, May, 20, uh, May 14, 2025, we'll be looking at how have we fared uh, in terms of collaboration between government and PBOs. So it's not, a, it's not a requirement. It's, you know, calling for some sort of collaboration. So if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. And nobody has committed any wrong. Is that what we're saying? No, that is... <laughs> that even in regulation, it's actually not a requirement that yeah. if you are NGO X mm -hmm. and you're working in a certain community, say yeah. in Gamba, in, in Tana River, yeah. mm -hmm. and this is after the devastation, we've seen what's happening, the floods, mm -hmm. devastated... So all these NGOs that are coming in, somebody is doing malaria, mosquito net, somebody else is coming in and doing seeds, somebody is doing other seeds, a different kind of seeds. You must first of all declare that this is what we I want to go and do, so that then all of you know we have someone coming in here. Mm. Or does it continue being the status quo as we have now? You'll have 75 NGOs mm. descending on Gamba, each doing something and writing a beautiful report. But we are saying currently, mm -hmm. it's a requirement that there must be collaboration between government What's and What's the framework PBO. for that collaboration? I, I mean... Um, it's, an, it's actually anchored within the PBO Act as is itself. So the Act does not envisage a situation whereby there's no collaboration between the government and, civils, uh, and, and public benefits organizations. So the long and short is, Eric, Eric what we're trying to emphasize is, one, the, what this act brings about is that you'd have a register whereby you can access, you know, the records of most of these public benefit organizations act. Now, of course, they will be public benefit organizations act that will may have the same. Um, uh, they may actually do the same. Uh, the, 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 the same kind of interventions, just like you have as many professionals in, you know, lawyers, doctors, and this and that. You can't say, you know, you're all, you know. Uh, neurosurgeons or this or that. So it may, we, we may not be envisage a situation whereby you could restrict what uh, specific PBOs could do. But what I can say that without a shadow of doubt is, Eric, is that when you look at the work that PBOs do on a daily basis, I am here to actually see a situation whereby actually Kenyans are overwhelmed by the support that they're actually giving out because PBOs actually come in to complement, you know, uh, the, the, the existing gaps that are already Martin, there. Martin, yes. We, yes. We, we have examples across the country yeah. where an NGO mm -hmm. moved into a certain community, started a project, it was a three-year project, yeah. mm -hmm. wrote beautiful reports, mm -hmm. three-year project, they left it hanging. Yeah. The issue of sustainability yeah. was not factored in. So community got to this point where they saw these guys come, they started a project, mm -hmm. they participated a bit in the project, three years or five years were over, and the thing is left and it's dead. We have very many of these things in the country. Yes, but I mean, when we have this law, 
there are quite some very good intentions uh, in, in, I mean, in this law, sustainability collab uh, collaboration. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we talk about collaboration, and, and when I was talking about the, the joint committee, which is going to monitor the principle, I mean, the, I mean compliance with these principles, the intention is very clear. We already know what is ailing the industry, I mean the sector. And um, so the assumption is that um, this, the intention of the act is very clear. It wants, I mean, it, it, it actually intends to help us cure this by bringing out, number one, we have uh, this joint committee, we have self-regulation forums at regional levels now. And um, just like we have county government and national government, and then we have the, uh, I mean, the, the teams that, I mean, where both county and national government cooperate, um, currently as we speak, even before this law, we've had quite some informal arrangements between NGOs and even county governments where you find county government is, I mean, has actually brought, uh, I mean, has signed MOUs with CSOs working in uh, gender, for instance, or health, for instance, so that they can actually coordinate and consolidate most of the work that they're doing. Now, this law is coming out to say, now we must comply with the spirit or the principle of collaboration. I, 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 that's very clear in the law. We must collaborate, government and PBOs. Next year, and next year, and every 12 months, we will be assessing how we are, I mean, how we are collaborating. Some of these things cannot be prescribed in the parent legislation. Some of them will actually be prescribed specifically in the regulations that are actually going to be the next discussion that we're going to have, the regulations to this law. And so we are hoping that as we walk through the transition period, then some of the teething challenges uh, will already have some of the solutions. And of course, next year when we do um, a post-mortem, we'll, we'll, we'll of course also see how best can we package some of the arrangements. And so yeah, the most important thing is the spirit, the intention, the principles that are within this law. Our yeah. civil society, public benefit organizations, yeah. Yeah. prepared to collaborate. I mean, civil, I mean, yeah. why haven't they been collaborating? Yeah. I'll ask I this. Think, okay, yeah. let's not even talk about yeah. community projects. Let's yes. talk about at, at national and bigger uh, yeah. in the space where you both play yes. on governance matters. The issue of civic education, not voter education, just civic education on matters, for example, of the constitution, of governance, of the requirements, the, the principles of devolution and all, is a conversation that happens at civil society level on a daily basis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yes. Now, if we look at the rate and level, the quality of public participation, let's say in the development of CIDPs, mm -hmm. in discussions around the budgets, mm -hmm. over the last 10 years, we still have very many gaps. Yet there are very many NGOs that will sit and tell you that they are involved in you know, engaging with the citizens on public participation, on creating awareness on governance, on you know, devolution and how devolution should work, but there's no cooperation and coordination. I you're, you're, I mean, I, I, you're, Eric, you are proceeding <laughs> you are from an assumption that the, the PBOs are not ready to, uh, to collaborate yes. with I have, government. I, I have not seen yeah. sufficient evidence to support yeah. any other claim. Well, well, it, it, well, yeah. it should well, be the other well, way around, actually. Yes, well, the well, government, Eric, I mean, the government is yeah, not yeah. ready to collaborate. Yeah, yeah but yeah. we've had several instances yeah. where PBOs have actually um, collaborated with, uh, I mean, with government. We have uh, in um, humanitarian situations, in um, constitution making not process. Not with government. With, yeah. Among yeah. themselves. Ah, I mean, we have. Oh, no, we uh, have actually. I mean, we, we have actually. Uh, we, we actually have yeah. uh, cooperated no, I mean, on multiple instances, yeah, Eric. If you look at the last, uh, or even, I mean, there are multiple examples I can cite. If you look at the election monitoring process right from the 2007 to 8 post election, uh, uh, you know, uh, violence and all that, you know, fast forward 2013, 2017, and, uh, 2017 and 2021 civil society organizations have actually monitored and documented uh, you know the, the electoral process collectively they have uh, uh, carried out civic education collectively and we have done that under those pieces of coalitions in 2022 we did that with the angaza movement that was a consortium of over 25 organizations uh, uh, and then in 2017 
uh, we did that with the, with, the, with, the, with the another coalition called Koreango Saotiango, fast forward. So that is just in as far as a, the electoral front is concerned. And even when you look at most of the public, I, I mean most of the public interest litigation cases that we file, we actually do so together with a number of civil society organizations. Now, when you flip the coin the other side, I think for the longest time, uh, public benefit organizations have tried to collaborate with the government on multiple instances. When you look at the different devolution conferences that have been held over the years, you would realize that there's heavy participation of civil society organizations, and that is a clear demonstration that uh, public benefit organizations are willing to work with the government. In instances where the national government has, um, I mean, if, if I can give you a more recent example, when you look at uh, uh, you know the, the, the weather, I mean the, the impact of the floods on Kenyans, the government of Kenya was actually overwhelmed, and it took public benefit organisations, the donor community, and other well wishes to come in and you know, to plug in that gap. So, the long and short of it, Eric, is um, over the years we have, when we, where we can, we have tried to collaborate with the government especially even when you look at this whole aspect of you know, public participation. We all know that for the longest time in Kenya, most, uh, most omnibus amendments are brought about towards the end of the year when most of us have gone you know, to spend time with our families over Christmas. Martin, we have a live example here. Yes, yes. We have a live example here. CFF, uh, Civic Freedoms Forum, yes. is a national platform. Yes. Organizations that are working on enabling environment, yeah. on human rights, mm. on governance, mm. This is the platform. Mm. Um, members join hands. Okay. Uh, number one, to minimize uh, the resources that we have. Number two, to maximize input and speak as one voice and as a team. Uh, so Civic uh, Freedoms Forum currently, as, uh, I mean, as, as we speak, mm. has, um, has members, has partners at county level. We've partnered with um, county uh, county networks, yeah. Yeah. Uh, county civil society networks in um, over 15 counties, as we see. So, uh, this is a live example. So, what do they do? So, uh, so the, the forums yeah. and, and yeah. coalitions of yeah. civil societies, yes. there are many. Yeah, so, so, so election monitoring yes. Yes. is a big one. Currently, yes. I mean, see it. so what, what do you actually do? Yes, yeah. so, I mean, and thank you for that because. Um, this opens it up even for other interested ones that would want to join. Number one is that, uh, first of all, our agenda is to bring everyone together to consolidate and coordinate civil society action on matters of civic space and enabling environment, specifically looking at freedom of association, freedom of assembly, access to information, freedom of um, uh, <clears throat> uh, the right to participate in public affairs, public participation that you are talking about. Mm -hmm. Organizations that work around those aspects have a platform where now they can come in and say, uh, we work in these counties, how many work in that county? Can we go as a team? We have this law called PBO Act. Yep. How do we work with government instead of having, you know, we have over, I mean, before the repeal of NGO Act, we had 13, over 13,000 NGO registered. Uh, and, and of course, even other than the NGOs, we had several others registered in other, other regimes. So we have a platform as CFF bringing all the PBOs working together. And of course, now we have an opportunity. Implementation of this law will need cooperation from PBOs John. and government. So I, I hear you. Yeah, yes. yes, I hear you. Yes. Give me an example. Yeah. A case study of where, through CFF and all your members, you've actually seen an increase in the number of people and the quality of engagement at public participation forums. So, <clears throat> and then you can tell me that this is because of the concerted effort. We have X number of civil society organizations that are involved in this particular community. Mm -hmm. Because of our efforts coming together, we have then been able to have better public participation. So I'll give an example, I mean, yes. very recent examples. Mm -hmm. um, number one, um, just a few months ago, uh, uh, starting, starting last year, late last year, uh, CFF and its members um, actually uh, supported the Kitui civil society organizations to actually come up with a, a law. It, I mean, they've never had a public participation act like several other counties. And so um, CFF and its members actually supported that network to draft a bill and then negotiate with government 
uh, for government to adopt it. As we speak, that bill is in the cabinet for an adoption. Um, just yesterday, I'm, I'm actually just from um, Kuala County, the office of the county secretary, as we speak, has actually initiated a process where um, the county, all the 10 county departments are actually currently drafting an engagement framework with the Kuala Civil Society Consortium to just ensure now that it's very easy to get CSOs to engage in public participation processes. Number two, it's very easy to also coordinate the work that now government, if government want to disseminate information on budget making process, there is a direct channel, very formalized. Yeah. Yeah, so those are some very easy, uh, very recent kind of uh, uh, milestones that we've achieved. As we speak now, last, mm -hmm. last week on Wednesday, CFF, together with over 300 uh, civil society organizations, met at Pride in Westlands to actually um, organize a petition, call for petition, to be tabled on 10th uh, during the 2024 UN conference. Um, we were just telling ourselves that probably the president must, must have had some whispers or the wind of our discussion because mm -hmm. our recommendation was one. After all the entire day's discussion, our recommendation was clear. Commence, commence, commence. Any other hiccups, we can talk about them in the next 12, in the next 12 months. Mm -hmm. Just to pick it up from uh, where Jonas left, I th mm. uh, the thing we have to point out, Eric, is, um, I mean, we actually had a discussion before we got here, is, you know, I was asking myself if the UN uh, Civil Society Conference of 2024 did not take place in Nairobi, mm. maybe we might have been having a different conversation, but uh, the beauty about this conference is that it actually maybe sustained, uh, I mean, it actually accelerated the already sustained pressure to actually deliver this act. Uh, the thing that maybe many viewers uh, may not know is that this journey to commence uh, or to operationalize this act has been a long journey for CSOs and it has been, you know, many instances of policy and legal engagements, sustained pressure, you know, having different conversations with governments, including, you remember I told you, there were two court orders that actually requested the government, you know, to commence this act. Mm. But, you know, here we are. And we must also point out that, you know, which is a conversation for another day, uh, we all know that the government is not very good at obeying court orders, but we are glad that, uh, you know, after about four or five years, we are here. Finally, we are where we are. Yes, we are where we are. So at okay. least if you, if, you, if you can do an analysis of government's obedience to court orders, we will always cite this as one. Well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, this we've is the seen, first time that we we'll cite, you know. We've seen over the last couple of years, particularly around the last general election, where there was concerted effort by the government to say any funding that goes into civil society organizations around this election needs to be channeled through one pot. Mm -hmm. And there was a whole conversation about um, are the civil society organizations then well resourced mm -hmm. to champion voter education, mm -hmm. to mobilize voters to come out, to engage the voters ahead of the election, mm -hmm. and to rally them around it. Mm -hmm. Does this bill cure such kind of things where the government cannot wake up and actually now, you know, have a backdoor conversation with the uh, various donor and uh, development partners and tell them, look, 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 mm -hmm. we, we, we want that money or we, we'd like to have a better way of engaging mm -hmm. with donors, government, mm -hmm. and civil society organizations. Does this law mm -hmm. make sure that that doesn't happen? Yeah, so, so before I, re I respond to that, I think it's important to emphasize, Eric, that for the longest time, we always know that the government of Kenya always comes up with you know, very retrogressive policy decisions. And what you just cited was one of them, because when that decision was made, it was not anchored anywhere in law of this. It was you know, a government directive. But fast forward, I think the Public Benefits Organization Act comes in to cure this because, you know, it enhances transparency. You don't envisage a situation whereby, you know, the government would come up with, you know, some regressive policy directive, you know, to claw back the gains that actually this progressive act does. Um, we are, um, uh, like John said earlier, we are optimistic and we look forward to, you know, to having, you know, robust engagement in as far as the regulations are concerned. It is our only hope and a prayer that uh, the regulations also do not take an inaudited period of time or we are not ambushed and told, you know, to come 
and you know do some semblance of public participation. So we hope to have a candid co uh, conversation, but this act comes in to cure that. Eric, maybe Kenyans need to know, and um, PBOs <laughs> uh, specifically need to know that uh, this law is not going to cure all our problems. Uh, when I say all our problems, I mean this law is not going to, I mean, by commencing this law, even if we implement it to the letter, it's not going to 100% um, um, ensure that Kenya has an enabling environment for civil society or for PBOs. We have quite a number of laws and policies that are actually very restrictive in nature and actually uh, if they are not looked at in terms of repeal, amendment and um, some even maybe uh, operationalized like just the PBO Act and I'm, I'm referring to some of the regulations like the access to information draft regulations that have been pending for the last two years, um, then we are not going to have a space that is as conducive as uh, we are thinking this bill is, I mean, this law, um, the PBO Act, uh, of course, offers an opportunity for the joint committee that I was talking about every year to also report on adhering to the principle of an enabling environment. And so we will be looking at, as we speak, CFF, in partnership with its members, have already done an audit of legislation that affect uh, enabling environment in Kenya. And we have a compendium of over 50 legislations and we, I mean PBO Act was just one of them so which means that we are looking at 50 plus other legislations that we still must ensure that are either repealed some of them are as old as our independence uh, that must be repealed must be amended some of them we actually just need to fast track their uh, I mean their, their enactment in Parliament like the whistleblower protection protection bill that has also been pending yeah. Okay. And just to pick up from um, where John has left, uh, Eric, that joint committee actually has its work cut out. Why? Because when you look at uh, the compendium of, of laws on civic space, it's a collection of clearly analyzed, you know, specific provisions that are one, not in tandem with our constitution, and two, make it extremely difficult for many Kenyans to, uh, to, you know, to enjoy uh, their chapter four, you know, the rights that are enshrined under chapter four. But more importantly, we also went further and came up with a digital case digest that identifies the specific laws that restrict, you know, Kenyans' enjoyment of their freedom to express themselves or associate online. So when you look at the Joint Committee, and, and those two publications actually provide for broad uh, policy recommendations, so their work is more or less cut out. I mean, they will not have to go and analyze, you know, all these hosts of laws. All right. Yes. I think, it's, well, it's important for us to actually say that, you know, after 11 years of the back and forth on this, that this law finally takes effect is a positive step. The onus is on everybody, yeah. the citizens, the public benefit organizations, the government and its agencies, to all come together and look at, so what does this law need to be fully implemented mm. and for better governance of the country? for the benefit of the public. Yeah. <laughs> Bottom line is, it's a public benefit. Yes. Yeah. Not individual benefit, yeah. yes. not big cars, yeah. not big salaries, yeah. um, yeah. and not big reports, yeah. but actual work done. <laughs> yes. uh, thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank you, Eric, for having us. Our guests this evening have been John Owega, he's the executive director of the Civic Freedom Forum, and Martin Mavengina, he is a senior advisor on transitional justice of the Kenya Human Rights Commission. Thank you very much for watching KTN Newsline. My name is Eric Latif. Do have a good night.